Today we're going to continue our look at the life of David as we're fast approaching the end of his life now. There's not an awful lot left to his story, but even so, there's still some tragedy that he's going to encounter. So when we left off last, David was fleeing from his own son Absalom, who wanted to take the throne uh, from him. Uh, Absalom ended up taking some bad advice that was intentionally planted by a man who was supportive of David in his cause. And rather than attack David when he was weak and on the run, Absalom decided to marshal together a big army of followers to sort of puff up his ego and uh, take down David that way. And I'll let the cat out of the bag from the beginning that uh, we're going to look at 2 Samuel 18 and Absalom does not survive to the end of this chapter. But the shame of it is that Absalom's death could have easily been avoided if he would have been content to live under the rule of David, his father, who was also his king. And the thing is, Absalom was a male in line of succession to the royal throne, so it follows that one day he could have possibly been king, but he wanted it now. He didn't want to wait, and the rest is history. The fact that his death could have been avoided is just one of several points of tragedy in this story. Uh, another tragic part is just from David's perspective how he loses his son in battle. And no, uh, no parent should ever live to see the death of their child. There's all too many instances in the world of parents outliving their children. Uh, I can tell you just a few years ago, a close friend of mine lost uh, his two-year-old son uh, unexpectedly. Uh, it was by far the most difficult funeral service I had ever been a part of. Uh, thankfully for me, I didn't actually officiate the whole thing. I was simply asked to help, and that was uh, difficult enough. But whenever I do funerals, I, am remind, I remind the people how unnatural it is for anybody to die which is an odd thing to say because everybody dies, yet it is still unnatural. God didn't intend it to be that way. Uh, and it is even less natural, if that's such a possible thing, to outlive your descendants. Now that's the sad uh, truth, but then there are also times in the world where people just die unnecessarily. Uh, sometimes, uh, to be completely honest, people do stupid things and it costs them their lives. And I was reading through some stories about bizarre things that have happened where people just were doing strange things and sadly they ended up losing their lives. It's sort of an uncomfortable tension because in a sense it's sort of funny that why would a person decide to do this thing and then, you know, they're actually dead by the end of it. Uh, just one of many examples, back in 1912, this actually happened. An Austrian tailor, an inventor named Franz Reichelt, uh, was committed to creating a jacket, a garment-like jacket that a person could put on and wear that would soften their descent to earth. Uh, sort of like a parachute, basically, uh, but from a less of a distance, you know, you don't have time to deploy an actual parachute. So on February 4th, 1912, he got permission from the French authorities. He climbed 187 feet up the Eiffel Tower to test his jacket slash parachute. Prior to this, he had run some successful experiments, throwing dummies out a uh, fifth floor apartment window. It seemed to work well. He said, well, the next step is to try it on a person. And I'll try it on myself. I guess he didn't get any volunteers for that. So, sadly, the parachute jacket, whatever you call it, did not deploy. He fell 19 stories to his death. It's just something that could have been avoided had he not jumped. Uh, certainly was a gruesome sight for those who turned out to watch at the Eiffel Tower that day. There were uh, witnesses. Uh, but uh, in the Bible passage today, uh, we'll read of another gruesome end to a, the life of this person named Absalom, who was David's son. 
Uh, there's a lot of details in this passage, so I want to really uh, focus our attention and um, uh, speak specifically to the issue at hand. Uh, we'll begin in 2 Samuel 18, uh, verse 4, um, but I want to sort of break it up into three shorter sections, so uh, it would... There's just a lot of details in there that I want to cut through. So I just want to start by reading from verse 4 through 9. If you follow in your pew Bible, it starts on page 228. So beginning in verse 4. Uh, so the king stood beside the gate while all the men marched out in units of hundreds and of thousands. The king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, be gentle with the young man Absalom uh, for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. The army marched into the field to fight Israel, and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. There the army of Israel was defeated by David's men, and the casualties that day were great, 20,000 men. The battle spread out over the whole countryside, and the forest claimed more lives that day than the sword. Now Absalom hoped, happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's head got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair while the mule he was riding kept on going. So I just want to skip up just a few verses to 14 now, do 14 to 17. Joab said, I'm not going to wait like this for you. So he took three javelins in his hand and plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. And ten of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. Then Joab sounded the trumpet, and the troops stopped pursuing Israel, for Joab halted them. They took Absalom, threw him into a big pit in the forest, and piled up a large heap of rocks over him. Meanwhile, all the Israelites fled to their homes. During his lifetime, actually, we'll stop there and just uh, move up to 30, verse 31, and then we'll go to 19.4. So in 31 now, then the Cushite arrived and said, My Lord, the king, hear the good news. The Lord has delivered you today from all those who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom safe? The Cushite replied, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up and harm, up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Joab was told, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. And for the whole army, the victory that day was turned into mourning. Because on that day, the troops heard it said, the king is grieving for his son. The men stole into the city that day as men steal in who are ashamed when they flee from battle. The king covered his face and cried aloud, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And we'll stop it there. We pray the Lord's blessing on the reading and the hearing of his holy word. I find there's a lot of interesting facts and ways that we could apply these stories of the Old Testament to our modern day lives, even though this scene probably took place about some 3,000 years ago. And as I research, I often go back to see what the old Jewish rabbis have said because they've been analyzing these stories for more than 2,000 years by the time it was written down, maybe even 2,500 years ago. And when we read those Jewish commentaries, we need to realize that Orthodox uh, Judaism doesn't accept Jesus as the Messiah. So if they find anything relevant or uh, complementary to Jesus, uh, they pretty much aren't going to include it there because it doesn't, you know, follow with their agenda. Uh, if they, so as New Testament Christians, though, we are looking back on these events with through the lens that Jesus has come and we can make uh, some uh, connections there because we know that Jesus was the fulfillment of the whole Old Testament. And so we can see pictures of Jesus in some of these characters as well. 
And just the other week is sort of the way that we related the traitor Ahithophel to the traitor Judas. And today we'll make some even some more connections. Uh, the problem, when you get into analyzing some of these Old Testament characters, is it can be a little confusing at times. Uh, take David, for instance. Sometimes he looks like a really good person and sometimes a really bad person. So in some sense, he's like a repentant sinner. Other times, he's a picture of Jesus. Again, it can't be both. It's just sort of a symbol. And we have to keep in our mind that these are just symbols when we are talking in this sense. Um, in this chapter, David represents Jesus, though, uh, while his earthly son Absalom re represents your normal, run-of-the-mill, unrepentant sinner. And what we have here is that Absalom is making an effort to overthrow his king, who is also his father, and that's David. So since David represents Jesus, look at how the battle is fought. David doesn't fight directly against Absalom, though, uh, just as Jesus doesn't take on sinners in a direct battle. If he did so, it would be a very quick battle indeed, because no one could stand up to Jesus even for a second. Uh, despite the efforts made to overthrow him, David still loves his child. And in the same way, God loves us, even though there are times in our lives before we came to Christ in faith that we opposed uh, God. And this is what the old uh, Jewish commentators are missing out. They don't see Jesus in David. And if you look at those Jewish writings, uh, they'll probably say something uh, sort of general to spiritualize things. Like Absalom is just a picture of the imminent downfall of vain people. And there's some legitimacy to that, but the fact is that's not the whole picture. Uh, they'll say how people who puff up their egos like Absalom did uh, will not win out in the end. And they also say something about, like, yeah, they said Absalom has very long, flowing hair, and that was supposed to be his glory. He showed this off to everyone, and that was his downfall because his long, flowing hair got his head caught in an oak tree, which is a very odd way for a person to die. Uh, we encounter that every now and then in the Bible. Therefore, we should be careful what we wish for. He wanted this long hair, and it's, again, what was his down, ended up being his downfall in the end. Uh, again, whenever you don't, you refuse to see Jesus in this, you're forced to find some other application or picture in there. But it means so much more than that. See, now, Christians and Jewish people alike will agree that Absalom does represent a person who opposes God because he clearly did oppose God. These individuals sometimes exhibit a great deal of pride in the fact uh, they don't humble themselves before God. Uh, the Bible tells us Absalom was an especially handsome man like his father David, and therefore his hair at the time sort of was a reflection of that. And, of course, that's what uh, spelled his doom in the end. Uh, but as Christian believers, believers of the New Testament, we have much more than that to hang our hats on. As far as Christians are concerned, it's possible that this actually could be, there could be a fulfillment of this in the future. When you go to the, uh, maybe it's a picture of this fulfillment in the book of Revelation. And what I mean there is there's an odd verse in our uh, passage we read this morning that said how the forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. And you wonder, what in the world what kind of a forest is this, you know? We're left scratching our heads, wondering how this can be taken seriously. And this is a place where the Jewish commentators can help us. They largely agree that forest of the day, probably in that area, had caves and swamps and various pits that would easily trap men who weren't familiar with the area. So it's not all that strange to say that the forest swallowed up these men. And once that's clarified, I find it interesting that more men died that way than were actually killed with the sword by David's army. So the verse shows us that God's hand was on this one way or the other. 
And what I mean by that is God allowed all these events to happen, which resulted in those who opposed him to enter this forest where they would ultimately meet their demise. But not only that, God ended up protecting David's army uh, from that same fate. And it's a, this here, though, is the message for all of us here. And I would assume there's many times in our lives where God fights battles for us. We have no idea what he is doing at the time. And we only see it after the fact that, yeah, God was working that out all along. Our point of view is just so limited, and I keep coming back to this theme as we look at the life of David, because it keeps popping up, and it should make us uh, perk up and take notice to this, that our point of view is just so limited, we have no idea what's even being prevented uh, or from us, because it's outside of our frame of reference. And if we knew that, I think it would only serve to deepen our appreciation of God and his love for us. Now, so far we made connections uh, between Absalom to the unrepentant sinner, and it follows that those who followed Absalom in the battle were similarly unrepentant like he was since they were swallowed up by the earth as we just explored. The swallowing up of people wasn't the only similar instance in the Bible. Um, Christians who read the Bible know that uh, it's not the last time this is actually going to happen, interestingly. Uh, again, I briefly mentioned like a minute ago, if you go to the book of Revelation, uh, which we, we know we aren't always 100% sure how to interpret it with the symbols and that kind of thing, uh, whether it's literal or figurative. But uh, what I do is just I look at it and I see what makes the most sense, basically. So if you would uh, go to Revelation 12 and just uh, at verse 15 and 16, it says, Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Now, without getting into a long discussion about what these two verses completely mean, uh, it just seems pretty obvious that the river is not a literal river. Uh, and again, if you uh, go into the original language, it probably is like a large army, maybe. You can say there was a river of men. You know, we know that's not a literal in a sense, but probably a large army because the text tells you that they're working up towards a battle at that time. And the fact that the, the earth helps the woman, who's also figurative, not prob probably not just one woman, seems to suggest some kind of supernatural power uh, of protection going on. Quite possibly could be a literal opening of the ground. Uh, we don't really know. If so, it wouldn't be the first time that happened. So when people try to throw that out as, oh, that, that's just uh, impossible, well, 2 Samuel 18 and 19 shows us that it happened at least once. Now, regardless of all that, the fact is that the story is telling us those who oppose God in the end will pay for it if they do not change their ways at the time that they have. And that leads to the point which concerns how God feels when people reject him. And that, this here is really the crux of the message this morning. In this chapter, we have what I think is one of the most heart-wrenching scenes in the Bible where David mourns the death of his son. Verse 33, it says, the king was shaken. And when it says shaken, this is the idea of a literal, physical trembling of a person. That's the kind of sorrow he felt. And when it's, then it says he went up to the room over the gateway and wept. And he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Notice the repetition in there. And that's not just because he's stuttering or anything like that. Uh, then it says, the king covered his face and cried aloud, Oh, my son Absalom, oh, my son, my son. Well, in the culture and language, they did that for a reason and for a purpose. And that was when you repeated a person's name, it was a way to show them affection and how much you loved them. 
Uh, so David does that here by repeating his name so often, my son, my son. And that's not an isolated incident in the Bible either. It happens a handful of times. I won't mention them all to you. I think we talked about this in a Bible study uh, a while ago. But you may recall um, Abraham back in Genesis. He goes up to on the mountain to sacrifice Isaac. And as he lifts the knife up to plunge it into Isaac's chest, God calls out and he says, Abraham, Abraham. It's a way of saying, I love you, Abraham. Don't do this. And then you go to uh, the book of Acts, for instance, and you have this Jewish man breathing threats against the new Christian church, and he stopped in his tracks on the road to Damascus, and Jesus calls out to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's saying, I love you, stop what you're doing. And in both situations, again, it's, it's intentional. Um, here's something else now. In your spare time this week, I know we skipped some parts here, again, in the interest of time and also not to get bogged down in the details, but if you go back and you read 2 Samuel 18, then go to the New Testament and find the story of the prodigal son. Uh, compare David to the father of the prodigal. Uh, one experience what it's like to have a child return to you while the other experience what it's like when a child rejects you all the way to the grave. The prodigal son shows us that we can humble ourselves and we can return, while Absalom shows us what can happen if we refuse to humble ourselves and if we allow hatred to rule our lives. Absalom's body, in the end, was thrown into a pit without a proper burial, and a pit is really a, uh, a picture or a reminder of the eternal hell that he experienced. Bible often refers to that as going down to the pit. So we have a literal pit here that's supposed to make a connection in our minds as to what his spiritual um, sense was like. So in the beginning, I talked about how some deaths are unnecessary, and that's the story of Absalom. Completely unnecessary death, at least when it occurred, of course. David knew that the death was unnecessary, and I think that's why it added to his grief as he calls out to him and he repeats his name. And then he says, if only I had died instead of you. In the beginning, I also said how in this story, David represents Jesus through this. And Absalom represents the sinner who won't humble himself and come before him. This is where the connection really comes together. This is where the rubber meets the road, as they say. In that exact same way that David wished he could die for Absalom, Jesus feels that same way every time an unrepentant sinner dies and goes to hell. We say Jesus died for the world, and in a sense he did, but specifically, he died for those who would receive him. Otherwise, we have some kind of universal salvation that the Bible just doesn't teach. For those of us who have accepted Christ into our lives, we accept his death on our behalf. And that's what it would be like if, for, uh, for David if he had died instead of Absalom. Uh, we reject when we reject the, our father, who is our king, just like Absalom did, we end up wanting to do things our way. We want to be the top dog. But when Jesus takes up residence in our lives, well, that changes things drastically, just like for the prodigal son as well, who finally realized he had a pretty th good thing going back there working for his father, as long as he would simply humble himself to to do, this, do the work, and the same goes for all of us. So I'm sh sure I've said this before somewhere along the way. I know I've run the numbers myself because that's what I typically do when I research this kind of stuff. And uh, numbers don't really change that much during the year as far as uh, mortality rates and that kind of stuff. But did you know that based on estimates, and these are conservative estimates too, 110,000 people today, if this is a normal day, are going to go into eternity without knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. 
And we know the Bible teaches us where they're going to end up. And these are just those who admit that they don't follow Christ. The number is probably higher than that because we know there's always going to be some people who say they are a true believer and really not. But uh, that just complicates things. What 110,000, is that a lot? Well, they just said college football is going to be starting up. Penn State's going to be playing in a month or two. I'm not even sure. When you see the games on TV up at Beaver Stadium and they have like their whiteouts and you got a stadium filled up in Happy Valley, I think that stadium holds somewhere between 106 and 108,000 people. So it's more than that one day going into eternity without knowing Christ. I estimate, based on how long I'm going here, that from the time I began preaching this message, more than 1,500 people died and went to hell. That means that uh, every time for those 1,500 people, Jesus echoes the words of David, if only I had died instead of you. In other words, he says, I would have died for you, but you just didn't allow me to. You didn't accept my sacrifice for you. So I just want to leave you with the reminder of the reality of this. We, we know it. But do we really know it, you know, that each of us faces an eternal destination? And it is my deep hope that everyone here is saved. And if it is your time to be up, you know where you're going. Since we are aware of the realities that await those who haven't put our faith in Jesus, it should be the natural response with the Holy Spirit inside of us to do everything in our power to urge other people to follow suit as we have and to make the same decision to follow Christ as we have. And that's even if it's only through what the Bible calls the foolishness of preaching too. And I know that numbers are difficult to follow, especially when someone's talking like this in a message. So just think of it this way. If you remember one thing, the reality, those who enter uh, eternity without Christ, more than one per second, it's like 1.1 or 1.2, it's like 76 a minute. You could get a calculator out and figure that out. These are people who rejected the sacrifice that Christ made. He already paid the price, but they didn't accept it. They simply chose not to accept it, and instead they said, I'm willing to stand before a holy God based on the things I have done, which isn't good enough. And, and you're paying that price for eternity. And it is my deep uh, hope and prayer that that would not be the case with any of us here. Let's now close out with a word of prayer.